1960, the average factory worker earned around $4,000 a month. In 2021, the average factory worker makes just about half of that. Where along the line did economic prosperity for the working class first experience its downward spiral? Today, I will argue that such change happened due to the unfair economic policies of Ronald Reagan. The 20-year buildup to the 1980 presidential election could not have been more favorable to Ronald Reagan. While the 60s saw great cultural and legislative change, from counterculture protests to the Great Society legislation, the 70s seemed to devolve into chaos, with the Watergate scandal, oil crisis, and Jonestown massacre just to scratch the surface. To add on to the cultural ills, the 1970s saw a period of stagflation, or high unemployment and inflation, which triggered an economic recession. By election time in 1980, most Americans had had enough. Many Americans saw the welfare system as the reason for economic downturn, not realizing the benefits they received from the program. The religious right gained popularity in their anti-sex and drug ideals. Many white middle-class Americans had concerns over the progressive legislature passed in the 1960s, such as the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, and how that legislature may diminish their social influence. Up steps the Republican presidential candidate, 70-year-old Ronald Reagan, a former B-movie Hollywood star and two-term California governor. Reagan's campaign promises included popular proposals, such as increased defense spending to find success in the Cold War, and an effort to solve America's energy problems. His biggest campaign promise, however, was his new economic policy, later dubbed Reaganomics. What is Reaganomics? Simply put, Reaganomics sought to cut government spending and federal taxes to reinvigorate the depressed economy. Reagan subscribes to the theory of supply-side or trickle-down economics, where tax breaks for wealthy Americans allowed them to reinvest more money into private business in turn creating more jobs and boosting the economy. Milton Freeman, one of Reagan's top economic advisors, suggested that tax cuts would work in two different ways. The first being the supply side strategy to boost the economy and the American people. And the second being that if the government had less money from taxes, they would be forced to spend less, shrinking the nefarious central government. As Reagan said in his first inaugural address as president, Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. This led Reagan to cut government spending in what was deemed unnecessary programs, such as welfare, to shrink the government and balance the budget. Did Reaganomics work? The answer is complicated. The economic principles the Reagan administration applied did lower inflation and unemployment rates from 8.9% to 4.9% and from 7.6% to 5.3% respectively. America escaped the recession of the 70s and its GDP increased by 77%. However, Reagan was not successful in balancing the budget. His overwhelming defense spending increased national debt by 188%. Also, and more importantly, the efficacy of Reaganomics in benefiting the whole of America was called into question. How did Reaganomics affect the poor? Reaganomics was very good for the rich. The maximum income tax rate dropped from 70% to 28%. The average pre-tax income of families in the top percent increased by 77%. And while the top 1% paid less than 27% of their total income in taxes, compared to 35% in the presidency prior, their payments amounted to a substantially larger share of the federal tax bill because their incomes grew so much. The middle and lower class did not have the same fate. Unlike the top 1%, whose pre-tax incomes increased by 77% during Reagan's presidency, the median family saw its income increase by only 4%. The bottom 40% saw declines in their income. This means that close to half of all American families were better off amidst recession than at the end of Reagan's presidency. Bosses by the end of the 1980s made an average of 120 times their workers in comparison to the mid-1970s, where the bosses made 35 times what their workers made. The Center on Budget and Policy Priorities found that the Economic Recovery Tax Act of 1981, after Social Security tax and inflation, reduced taxes for individuals with earnings over $200,000 by 15%, 
yet individuals with earnings under $10,000 would have to pay an increase of 15% in taxes. While the tax cuts of Reaganomics showed serious bias against working class America, the budget cuts were arguably worse. To balance the budget and offset the cut taxes, Reagan needed to cut government spending as well. Out of the $35 billion in budget cuts Reagan made in the first seven months of his presidency, about $25 billion of that, or 70%, were made in programs affecting the poor, or households with incomes under $20,000 annually, or 48% of the population. It was no surprise that Reagan wasn't a fan of welfare programs. In 1976, Reagan conjured the image of a welfare queen, a black woman who, according to Reagan, holds 80 names, 30 addresses, and 15 telephone numbers to collect food stamps, social security, and veterans benefits for four non-existent deceased veteran husbands. Her tax-free cash income alone has been running at $150,000 a year. Reagan perpetuated these stereotypes to be able to make such drastic budget cuts to welfare and similar programs without too much public backlash. Reagan cut benefits significantly to the working poor and was able to cut 1 million people off of food stamps in his first two years. Child nutrition programs were cut by 28%, while housing assistance and Medicare were cut by 5% each in Reagan's first term. Houses with incomes under $10,000 would lose an average of $470 in benefits. $10,000 to $20,000 would lose $360 in benefits, while houses with income above $80,000 would only lose $170 in benefits. An extremely regressive system. The welfare rights movement of the 1960s, a movement consisting of minority women, claimed that welfare was a guaranteed right rather than a necessary evil. They argued that the New Deal programs, GI Bill, and Great Society welfare did not reach far enough. Each of those bills were inherently driven by race, where most of the benefits were afforded to poor and middle-class white Americans, and nothing was left for minorities in need. Reagan's complete neglect for the reality of the situation and the people in need of welfare programs should be understood as a big step back in our country's search for equality. As Johnny Tillman, chairperson of the National Welfare Rights Organization said, I'm a black woman, I'm a poor woman, I'm a fat woman, I'm a middle-aged woman, and I'm on welfare. In this country, if you're any one of those things, you count as less of a human being. If you're all of those things, you don't count at all. The phrase trickle-down economics is a satirical rendition of supply-side economics. Critics of supply-side economics gave Reaganomics the name trickle-down to ironically show that while Reagan may have intended that the wealth earned from these tax breaks would trickle down to the working class of America through economic prosperity, the reality was that such tax breaks would only help the rich, and the tangible prosperity of a booming economy would not trickle down past the upper class. Even Reagan's Vice President George H.W. Bush dubbed supply-side economics as voodoo economics, an anecdotal theory that would not benefit the masses in practice. It was remarked by David Stockman, Reagan's first director of the Office of Management and Budget, that the president was particularly fond of anecdotal evidence, as can be seen with the infamous welfare queen. I sought to recreate the promises of Reaganomics in some sort of thought experiment. Thus, I asked 50 students this question. Funded by the school, would you support a tuition reduction for senior members of the Order of the Gown? The Order of the Gown is a sort of honor society, where students of a high enough GPA are inducted into a society and forced to buy a $300 robe. The elitism of this on-campus society is very much reflected in modern consumerism, and quite frankly, should be changed by the university to be more inclusive. But that's a topic for another day. The annual average of students inducted into the society is around 15 to 20 percent of the student body based on numbers provided by the school. And while exact numbers aren't given on how many seniors are inducted annually, a fair estimate would be about 25 to 40 percent of the order of the gown population, or 3 to 8 percent of the entire student body. The group of gowned seniors represents the top 10 percent of Americans during Reaganomics. I am suggesting a tuition reduction for this group of students in the hopes that the wealth of education trickles down to ungowned students through peer tutoring and etc. However, 
The most likely outcome is that senior students choose to spend their money and time on themselves in their future, rather than giving back to other students. Furthermore, the school budget will decline, leaving less money to pay for new infrastructure, upkeep of current buildings, and staff and teachers' payrolls. The school may very well see a decline in the quality of education and quality of student life, all because of a tuition reduction to a small percentage of the student base. However, the survey data does not reflect that the student base took into consideration the potential consequences of such a policy. 45 out of 50 students, or 90% of the sample, said that they would support the proposal. Only 5 out of the 50 polled were senior members of the Order of the Gown, who all said yes. The majority of those polled were freshmen to symbolize the working class, and out of the 35 freshmen polled, only 3 said no. The other two no's came from junior members of the Order of the Gown. In this experiment, they are equatable to the intelligent dissenters of Reaganomics, who could see possible pitfalls in the policy. This experiment shows, despite possible concerns, a reduction in the amount of money one needs to pay to an entity will most likely be favorable. That is certainly something Walter Mondale could have told you in 1984. Reaganomics is yet another example of an American policy that appears like it benefits everyone, but instead only benefits very few powerful people. You can add it to the list of such legislation, including the two-tiered welfare system, Chinese Exclusion Act of 1888, and the exclusion of women from the 14th Amendment, just to scratch the surface. Historians have argued that the economic inequality suffered during Reaganomics and continued far after his presidency led to working class America to be enraged in the system and to vote an enigma like Donald Trump into office. The continued rise of the wealthy in this country and the leaving behind of all the rest signifies the need for radical change soon to ensure that America becomes truly a nation for all.